homosexuality or not, heterosexuality or not, the universe is trust me always disturbed by love because love tends to break people away from conventions. Love tends to empower people to question conventions and society doesn't want that. And that is why society reinforces the idea of responsibility, family, codes, ethics, rituals, marriage and it's uncomfortable talking about love. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. Today we are going to look at a very unique poem by Emily Dickinson. It's called, I Cannot Live With You. I've never done any Emily Dickinson with you, but I really plan to do a lot more than just this one. This is going to be quite an interesting class, I promise you. And I'm really looking forward to this. I hope you stay till the end of this video with me and if you like Nibble Pop, please do subscribe. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. Why does a poet write? Why does a poet make the effort to write something which he or she knows that the world wouldn't even understand perhaps. One answer is a poet writes to communicate, to tell people about things which matter to him or her. But what if that poet goes on writing and writing and writing for like decades and then no one gets to see them officially published not until the person is dead. When I think about it, the only thing that comes to my mind is extreme honesty and a feeling that if I cannot write, I cannot survive. So out of that honesty, out of that feeling of inevitability of writing, we have the figure of Emily Dickinson. She was born in a middle class family and her father, he was a lawyer, a very uh, dedicated church goer. He wanted to educate his children uh, with the teachings of the church. Emily, she grew up in a regular school, but when she went on to higher studies, uh, back then girls were exposed to only one kind of education, uh, the education of divinity. And then they were taught how to manage households and stuff. Emily couldn't adjust to that kind of teaching. And she was a rebel against any kind of institutional conservative way of thinking about the world. She was an extremely religious person. She believed in God, of course. She believed in afterlife. But she hated the way the church manipulated people and turned it into an institution of decorum all right all through her life she spent without getting married almost alone most of the time and spent every hour of her life writing or thinking about what she's about to write nobody knew her Nobody knew that after her death, she would be regarded as one of the greatest American woman poets. No, one of the greatest American poets that we have till now. She was born in 1830 on December 10th and she died in 1886. So she had a long life. Yes, she did. But her books of poems were published not before 1890. Another interesting trivia that I want to share with you before jumping into the poem is that on her gravestone, you know, when somebody gets buried after death, they have this gravestone on which people write all kinds of things. 
you know things that represent that kind of person who is buried on emily dickinson's gravestone only two words are inscribed called back so it's it's very eerie it's very unique the way uh, she carried an enigma about herself nobody knew what kind of person she really was some people thought she was a crazy woman living all alone and some people thought she had immense possibilities we will come to uh, some of the biographical details after we finish this poem we will go through the lines and then we'll try to find out the literal meaning uh, i mean what kind of meaning emerges out of this poem if we don't know about emily dickinson and then we will see what kind of meaning emerges how the meaning modifies or what interpretations are opened up once we relate emily dickinson's life to the lines of this poem okay so let's just begin i cannot live with you it would be life and life is over there behind the shelf the sexton keeps the key too okay she doesn't allow us to stop when the first stanza ends we roll over to the next stanza i have discussed this in uh, various uh, poem lectures earlier too this device is called an enjambment where we roll over to the next line we don't stop at the end of one line okay now what is unique about this poem this is structured like a love sonnet although it's not a sonnet technically but it's structured like that she is giving a proposition and then she is talking against it first she is saying i cannot live with you usually we expect poets writing about love saying that they cannot live without the lover here the poet is saying that she cannot live with the lover and why is that it would be life so we will first try to understand the literal meaning perhaps she means that if she lives with her lover then that is going to be called life life as in ordinary domestic life and ordinary domestic life is something which she does not want with her lover and she feels that life is over there once i get into this domestic relationship with you my life is over this is one meaning okay another way of looking at it is she is defining life what is life what is the normal way of living she lived during the uh, you know victorian times like what was victorian times in england uh, although she was an american citizen still the ethos were conservative okay and within that conservative context life especially for a woman was defined by certain codes decorum you had to follow certain ways of living certain ways of expressing yourselves and she is defining a woman's life for us in the next lines she doesn't want that life with her lover and what is that life behind the shelf now usually what do you keep on shelves okay you keep books but she is further defining the word shelf it's not a book shelf this is like a kitchen shelf okay or a sideboard uh, you know you have beside your dining table behind the shelf the sexton keeps the key to i'll come to the word sexton just move on and see what life is the sexton keeps the key too so she is talking about a shelf which is locked and the key is kept by someone called sexton putting up our life his porcelain like a cup so this person sexton he is always putting up and decorating and displaying these cups and a small little china uh, ornamental saucers and plates on this shelf and this act is so full of meticulous perfection okay so who is the sexton now sexton is 
a person who works at a church uh, but he is not a priest or a person who gives these sermons. Sexton is more or less like a person in charge of the churchyard, the graveyard in a church. Um, he has uh, these duties of ringing the bells and uh, sometimes he had these very weird duties. Earlier when people used to be buried, um, medical science was not so advanced. So often uh, people made mistakes uh, as to if a person was really dead or not. So this dead person, whoever was buried, was also given a bell which the person would ring if it was a mistake, if that person was alive even after being buried. So the sexton's job was to keep track of those uh, ringing bells uh, and also to do other duties of the church which is not a divine duty but it's more like a management duty. Okay. So what does the sexton manage? So sexton represents any kind of church official who looks after the maintenance of decorum, of rituals. Okay, we have this word sexton in many of Emily Dickinson's poems. I uh, now remember two poems at least. One is uh, sexton, my master sleeping here. It starts like that. And there's this poem where uh, she is comparing a bird to a sexton because a bird is uh, singing like ringing of bells and for her the bird is a better sexton than a real sexton because the bird brings her closer to nature and nature is her real church. So that poem is uh, some keep the Sabbath going to the church and that kind of a poem. So, so this obsession with the word sexton uh, brings in this idea of Emily Dickinson's preoccupation with the idea of death. And the rituals of death. So this sexton figure, this person working in the church is like a guardian figure. He defines how our life should be and she is saying our life is porcelain. Our means, maybe she means lives of women. Lives of women are put on display. Okay, they are judged for everything that they do or did and somehow their lives are controlled by the dictates of the church. Okay, so she feels that a sexton puts on these frail little ornaments or frail little china on a shelf and she feels like a frail china cup. Okay. Our life is porcelain like a cup, discarded of the housewife, quaint or broke, a newer severs pleases, old ones crack. So what happens to a cup which you put on a shelf? First is it wears out over time, it cracks up and then it's discarded. So this domestic metaphor of China. This, this thing is made of China, bone China, which is described variously as, you know, discarded, broken, quaint, put up on a shelf, forgotten. So that is life, life of a woman, life of a woman who is engaged in a domestic relationship. She doesn't want this kind of life. She wants an intellectual life, perhaps. So she cannot live with this lover because then that would be an ordinary life and she doesn't want to turn her relationship into something ordinary. That is the first apparent meaning. Second is, I could not die with you. Okay, so if you cannot live with somebody, then of course you will not die with the person too, right? I could not die with you, for one must wait to shut the other's gaze down you could not. Now you must have noticed by now she uses a lot of dashes in her sentences as if she deliberately breaks the lines. Earlier we have seen that she is uh, talking about the cup, porcelain, broke, quaint, you know, separating these words with dashes as if the lines are also cracking up and then when she talks about why she was doesn't want to die 
with her lover she is again using dashes she doesn't want to die with this person or rather she says she cannot die with this person she explains the reason one must wait to shut the other's gaze down so gaze of a lover keeps love alive and when the person you love that person dies you need to shut their eyes down so you need to shut the gaze but death is a very private experience you cannot share death even when you die at the same time you cannot share somebody's death like you share somebody's life but this act of shutting down the lover's eyes at that last moment it's a very difficult thing to do so she is saying you could not you could not wait to shut the other's gaze down you could not wait to shut my gaze down two meanings come out of it she feels that her lover will not wait for her when she is about to die or her lover could not tolerate the suffering when he would see her dying and i could i stand by and see you freeze without my right of frost death's privilege so what about me can i watch you dying without myself freezing to death can i see you freezing to death so death is compared to frost here so she wants to claim the right of death the moment the lover dies but will she have that privilege will she have that opportunity she doesn't know so this this might sound kind of weird that you don't want to spend your life with somebody you love just because you don't want to face the moment of that person's death so you are ready to accept suffering for the rest of your life because you don't want to suffer at the end confusing isn't it let's read on nor could i rise with you now what is this rise about you know in christian belief uh we have this idea of resurrection rising after death that after death uh, everybody is uh, buried in the earth where they wait they wait for that final judgment day the doomsday and on the doomsday what happens they think that god will raise them all from their death okay and god will judge jesus will judge and based on that judgment you will be sent to heaven or hell simple simple there but she is saying that she cannot rise with the lover suppose both of them are dead and buried and doomsday has arrived and god has decided to raise them all and judge at that point she says i will not be able to rise with you and the reason is because your face would put out jesus's i mean she is so consumed with this obsessive love for this person that she is not going to look at the face of jesus even okay and she then defines the face of jesus that new grace glow plain and foreign on my homesick eye so when i would look at jesus's face on that judgment day that face would look so ordinary to me and so distant so foreign it wouldn't really matter to me because her eyes have become homesick homesick for what homesick for seeing her lover because they have been dead for long and buried under the earth now the doomsday has arrived so it was a long wait for both of them so after that when they rise from there she wouldn't even look at jesus she would look for the person who has consumed her all senses and of course when god sees that god would be very angry and she cannot rise to heaven right except that you than he shone closer by so even when compared to the pristine sight of jesus the lover would seem to be more appealing for this speaker they'd judge us 
again two meanings it's judgment day so god and his angels will judge them they also might mean society at present so they judge us because this kind of love is not acceptable to society the kind of love which takes you away from god uh, which takes you away from divinity is considered to be a sinful love so is it some kind of love which is forbidden is it some kind of lover who is out of bounds for her we will discuss that later let's just just have the literal meaning here so they would judge us how for you served heaven so now she wants to understand what kind of judgment is in store for them for that final day of judgment you served heaven you know or sought to i could not so in their lives this lover figure this figure has served the church that means her lover has always been uh, faithful to the dictates of the church has followed the uh, the rituals religiously and therefore one kind of judgment is waiting for that lover but the speaker could not do that so a different kind of judgment is waiting for her why could the speaker not serve heaven when she was with her lover because you saturated sight you know if you take a glass of water and start dissolving sugar in it after a certain point you cannot dissolve any more sugar this is called saturation the water has reached the saturation point it cannot take in any more sugar no matter how much you stir so this love for this person has filled her heart has saturated her heart her eyes so much that no other sight is possible to have any effect on her you saturated sight and i had no more eyes for sordid excellence as paradise and i had no energy left i had no vision left to see paradise and she is using an oxymoronish expression here sordid excellence usually we have this word sordid meaning something which is dull uh, something which is uninspirational and something which lacks life and excellence is something you associate with perfection so paradise is perfect but it is sordid because paradise does not have her lover i had no more eyes for sordid excellence as paradise and were you lost so she is now talking about two possibilities it is judgment day god has taken everybody out of their graves and now god is judging the souls okay so god looks at her lover and there are two possibilities one is the lover is sent to heaven or the lover is sent to hell so in the first possibility where you lost lost means if you were sent to hell if you lost yourself in that way like satan had in paradise lost i would be so if you were lost automatically i would also feel that i am in hell even if god placed me in heaven though my name rang loudest on the heavenly fame even if at that point the angels were singing my name in fame if you were in hell i would feel i am in hell and the second situation and where you saved saved means if you were assigned a position in heaven if you were saved and i condemned to be where you were not and i was sent to some place where i wouldn't find you then that would automatically be hell that self were hell to me so in both situations i cannot rise because i am definitely going to hell so what is the solution we must meet apart again beautiful contrast is made here between the two words meet apart 
apart means away from each other meet means coming together so she is putting these two words together and saying we must meet apart you there i here notice the dashes are putting her like in a place away from the lover she is secluding i away from the words which come before and after it you there i here with just the door ajar ajar means when the door is closed but not shut but not bolted so if you give a little push the door will open so there is a door between them but that door is not a very strong one it's not something which will never open but it is not open so it's a possibility but not a certainty with just the door ajar that oceans are what is she doing here is she comparing doors to oceans or is she trying to tell us about the oceans for example the atlantic ocean the pacific ocean the indian ocean they are away from each other aren't they but somehow they are connected to each other too because what is this earth this earth is just a little bit of land floating about on a on a huge common area the great ocean which we see divided into oceans but all of them are connected so this subterranean connection of oceans is like this door which is ajar which is not going to break open because once it opens this whole world will be flooded and that white sustenance despair when you look at an ocean you see white colored surf on the top when the waves crash against the land it is as if the oceans are trying to reach each other the crashing on the land and that is creating the wave and that is creating sustenance for the sea this is a life because of that so that white sustenance white is again a symbol of purity virginity abstinence when you are actually away from your lover that that feeling of being alone you associate it with white but when you look at the ocean white is the color of disturbance because when the ocean is not disturbed it is blue it's green it's black it's white only when it crashes against the land so that door which is keeping them apart is also creating in her this disturbance and this disturbance is mentioned here as despair so this despair is keeping her alive sustenance means nourishment it's nourishment for her soul completely open ended we don't know what she's actually talking about and we really feel very confused what's the problem here you love this person you just be with the person let's go back to the first stanza let's just see what the problem is let's just look into these words again i cannot live with you okay so she's talking about somebody a relationship with whom might not be approved by the society so she cannot live with the person because if it is approved by the society it would be life life which is you know put on display on a shelf which is regulated by these church authorities uh, which is defined by uh, household activities and assigned roles when you crack you are discarded replaced by something new and fresh she is beginning with a sense of impossibility and then she is going on to this idea of an inevitable separation if i am with you i cannot live the life which i want to live with you that is for sure and then later when she is saying that i cannot die with you she is saying that she 
is afraid of the moment when she has to let go of her lover. Although I believe that every poem generates a meaning irrespective of our knowledge about the poet's life, the poet's choices. This poem does too. But what if we had some information? What if we had some ideas about what could have been the real problem here? Why so much apathy against the church? Why so much concern with the society? Why so much abhorrence for a life saying that it's put on shelf? Why is so much concern for being displayed? There is absolutely no record of Emily Dickinson's affairs with any man up to any notable consideration. In short, we don't know about her boyfriends. What we do know about is a person called Susan Gilbert. Susan was a person who came into her life in a very strange way and she became quite close to Emily. How close? Emily's brother, he got married to Susan. It was a very private wedding. Only very near and dear ones were invited. They had only cakes and little wine perhaps, not, not much of a gala event or something. But all through her life, Susan had been the person who had seen all of Emily's writings. She was like a muse to her, her inspiration. And in the letters that Emily wrote to Susan, I would try to give some of the uh, lines which are found on those letters on screen for you to see. The gist of the matter is, People might say that, okay, back then women had very intimate relationship with each other because men did not give them the kind of intellectual space or intellectual uh, you know, companionship, fine. But there are really moments when we see she is being very, very overtly ardent about her, passionate about Susan. And this poem was written, we don't know the exact date because see, all the poems were published officially four years after Emily Dickinson's death. But a tentative timeline is that it was written during 1860s, right after Susan had her first baby. And probably she was away uh, in her household duties, preoccupied with her new motherhood. And Emily was feeling that she was going away from Susan now. Finally, that Susan has gone on to her duties as a wife, as a mother, following the dictates of the church. So now with this information at the back of our minds, if we reread the poem very quickly, what would, what would we find? I cannot live with you, it would be life. Life, man, woman living together, sanctioned by the church, she can never have that with Susan. And life is over there, behind the shelf, it's on display and we will never be able to bear the brunt of a society where we will be judged. I could not die with you for one must wait to shut the other's gaze down. She will never be able to be at her deathbed. Why? Because could I stand by and see you freeze without my right of frost? When a person dies, suppose a husband dies or a wife dies, the spouse who is living has rights. What kind of rights? The right to stand uh, at the bedside to be the person to you know, shut the eyes. That husband figure, that wife figure has the first rights. Death's privilege. When Susan would die. If Susan dies before her, Susan's husband would be the person to shut the eyes of Susan. It would never be Emily. 
because she will never have the right of frost, right of death. Now, now things are getting clearer. But here, we cannot say this for sure. It's only, again I'm telling you, it's only a speculation. But she certainly is talking about a lover figure who will not be approved by society. And that is why she cannot go to the deathbed of that lover because some other person has that right of death. She will never have that. So she cannot die with you, in front of you, with you being the person who will have the right to close my eyes, to shut my eyes. Now with this thought in mind, we can easily understand why she is so preoccupied with the idea of judgment. Not just judgment of society, but judgment of God. Because, uh, well, Christianity is a conservative religion and it does not accommodate alternative sexual ideas or ideas about homosexuality. So somehow she feels that her judgment will not just be from society, but from God himself. And so she somehow rejects God rejects divinity and when she says and where you lost I would be she is not just talking about heaven or hell she is talking about heavenly fame Emily Dickinson has a heavenly fame doesn't she she is so famous but she says that I might be famous someday but I would be lost if you were lost so perhaps that's why uh, to make sure that she doesn't feel lost, we should think about the person who meant so much to her. Now this line specifically brings to my mind this uh, line from Shakespeare, you know, so long as men breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. So this idea of, uh, of sharing fame, uh, this is also seen in case of Spencer. And we also find this idea of two lovers being united in a poem. So this poem is something where she has decided to meet her lover because they do not have this, this access to each other anywhere outside the lines of poetry. So this is the place where they can meet. But there will still be a door which perhaps the readers need to push to understand the real meaning. Both of them are here. You, there, I, here. So both the figures are there in this poem. We need to understand. We need to identify. Because through our identification, there will be a possibility of union. And she's talking about a white sustenance. What? The paper on which she was writing? The paper which is keeping her alive because she can write on it. She can write about her despair on it. So this paper is the white sustenance. The waves crashing against the land is the white sustenance. The suffering is the nourishment which will keep her alive. Where? Through interpretation of the readers. So this is what Emily Dickinson is. Whenever I use the word Emily, automatically Bronte comes to my lips. So I don't know if I've made that slip of tongue in this video, I don't remember. If I have done that, please forgive me. Um, Emily Bronte was also a very, very unique character. Someday maybe we will talk about Emily Bronte. So what I want you to understand is, she is using a lot of poetic device. And when is she using this? When you have Victorian poets in England, not showing much of a spark there, more of like dragging on whatever romantic poets were throwing at them, except for Robert Browning, of course. In Dickinson, we have this kind of imagism, which we see in Eliot, the kind of expressions that she uses and the boldness with which she uses them. She breaks all conventions of rhyme. She breaks rhyme. She breaks uh, sentence length, she breaks the use of punctuation, she breaks the convention of carpe diem. What do carpe diem poets say? They say that 
uh, okay life is short so just let's get together let's let's live life while we can she is saying that there's no point because there will never be a union so it's anti carpe diem she is distancing herself from this idea of union sexual union even emotional union because she can understand that this union is defined by certain codes a love for her is about freedom from any codes society cannot allow freedom when it comes to love you need to abide by certain principles certain rules certain rituals and her kind of love was beyond all rituals even her love for god was not bound by rituals she was more like william blake in that the last word despair as the one word which occupies the whole sentence whole line there and it's it has a resounding effect on the speaker it it does not end the poem in an, on a decisive note we do not know what she actually means when she says white sustenance despair is the white sustenance going to despair or is she going to despair because she only has white sustenance not a so called green sustenance or fulfilled uh, state of being she has an emptiness which makes her survive the line ends once again with a dash it doesn't end with a full stop it doesn't end uh, with any conclusive punctuation ending on this pause you know it emphasizes the silence once again this poem is strangely silent and withdrawn like a like an ocean withdrawing but also it leaves the poem uh, in a sense unfinished because relationships are unfinished and if you are really honest about it this is so much like proof rock who says do i dare disturb the universe in iliad's poem the love song of j alfred prufrock so woman prufrock here who doesn't want to engage in a relationship because the universe would be disturbed homosexuality or not heterosexuality or not the universe is trust me always disturbed by love because love tends to break people away from conventions love tends to empower people to question conventions and society doesn't want that and that is why society reinforces the idea of responsibility family codes ethics rituals marriage and it's uncomfortable talking about love emily dickinson does not want to define her love through any names given by society because that would be limiting the relationship and that would never give her the real right that she wants to have so this is a love poem and a poem of despair and a woman living decades all alone despair and love could not be separate from each other and such honesty her preoccupation with death she grew up in a house uh, for 15 years she lived in a house which was right next to a cemetery a burial ground of course she would be obsessed with death maybe some day i'll read with you her poem because i could not stop for death and you would see how she imagines death to be a a person taking you away as if you are this bride being carried off on a wedding carriage people define feminism with waves and so many other ways but this is a different kind of feminism she knows what she wants and she knows that it is not possible in this society and she accepts that and at the same time she doesn't give in she doesn't serve the gods 
her life is her rebellion she doesn't need any weapons sometimes the greatest rejections can be offered through calmness and that is emily dickinson perhaps she was crazy but she was writing this even before charlotte perkins gilman wrote the yellow wallpaper before sylvia plath wrote daddy and perhaps that's why she has this great impact on the idea of american women poets as bringing in that voice of change as bringing in that voice of modernism even before the world wars shattered the world so that's emily dickinson for today i hope you have liked the poem please comment uh, anything that you feel like uh, i must have missed uh, some of the uh, words which i should have explained in detail point them out to me if you want uh, so that we can have these discussions in the comment section i have never taught this poem uh, before today so i don't know how this uh, this lecture looked like to you so your feedback will really really help me understand how we can make ourselves better okay so there we are at the end of this video thank you all for being here with me i hope you will keep coming back for more lecture videos our next video will be up very soon till then stay happy stay subscribed this is monami mukherjee signing off Thank you.